All right. Welcome. You've reached uh, Research Rabbit Hole, the latest episode. I'm Ron Coddington, the editor and publisher of Military Images, welcoming you this evening, this Monday evening. So happy that you're able to join us tonight. If you are not joining us tonight and are coming in uh, after the broadcast is, uh, is live, I welcome you. Um, thank you for tuning in. Whether you're on Facebook or on YouTube, we appreciate your support. If you're seeing us on YouTube, uh, give us a like or subscribe. We'd really appreciate that to help spread the good word about military images. So the program is brought to you by Military Images Magazine. We've been around since 1979, and our mission is unchanged. We showcase, we interpret, and we preserve images from the Civil War period and before and after, but always surrounding the Civil War period. And of course, along the way, there's an amazing number of journeys that uh, we go on as we're researching these amazing images that are such an important part of our history. So I wanna start tonight by launching our new episode and it's called Posing 101. So bear with me for just a moment while I share our presentation and uh, we will get going right now and uh, let's get it started. So, posing 101. When you see images like this one here, this gentleman, this soldier is looking uh, rather dapper. He's got his uh, document in hand. He has his pipe uh, stuck in his cap and a neat nifty storage place. Ultimately, you have to ask a question. Why was he posing like this? Is this uh, a pose that he came up with? Did he see a chair in the studio and say, oh, I'm gonna put my foot up on that chair and I'm gonna strike this pose and I have this document in my pocket and I'm gonna pull it out and we're going to pose with it. It's possible, but I'll bet you've given some thought to that. How about this image of a Pfeiffer from Megan Kemble's collection? This Pfeiffer is sitting straight forward. He's looking directly at the camera. He's got a grip on that Fife. You know he's a musician. You know he's proud of that Fife. He's showing it to us. How did he come to pose that way? How about this officer? He's standing posed with the Star Spangled Banner behind him. He has his hands at his sides. He's dressed, he's, he's in his full dress uniform and uh, he's looking exactly right at you. Why did he pose that way? One more, this gentleman, this Confederate soldier holding his Bowie knife and a fife and uh, a revolver from the Matt Oswalt collection, he's sitting straight forward. How did he do that? How did he think to do that? Did he come up with this pose by himself? Well, if you're wondering about those questions, I'm gonna share two perspectives with you tonight. One of them is the first one we're gonna get into. Uh, and these are instructions from a photographer to his patrons. So I'm gonna go through and share with you some information from this particular photographer. And then we're going to look at one of the master early photographers. And we're going to get a sense of the advice that he gave to uh, fellow practitioners, his fellow photographers working in the field. So let's start here with a photographer named B. Bradley. Now, this particular pamphlet is one that survived his travels. He was an itinerant photographer traveling from town to town. He brought with him these brochures that he handed out to the population to help them get acquainted with photography. Now, you have to wonder if this photographer is going into small towns, perhaps around a certain state, around a certain region, a certain part of the country, 
And I don't know that yet because I really haven't researched him as a photographer. What, st <laughs> what stopped me in my tracks was this brochure um, because it's just so fascinating. It's four pages long and I'm gonna take you through it uh, so you can get a sense of what it's all about. But Mr. Bradley or Ms. Bradley, we don't know uh, if he is a, a man or a woman right now, but we'll find that out in just a moment. Um, Bradley was a traveling photographer perhaps going into places where they hadn't seen much of photography. Remember in the 1860s, photography is uh, 20, 25 years old. And um, you would think that most folks had probably posed, but it's also possible that some had yet to pose for a photograph. It's also important to know that time is money Bradley, the photographer, is moving through towns. He wants to get the townspeople excited. He wants to get them prepped for this exciting adventure to have their photograph taken, probably in his photographic wagon. So he wants them to have the very best experience possible. And so he's offering the, the, the patrons in town some tips. So for a moment, you might pretend that you're one of those townspeople and photographer Bradley's wagon has just come rolling down the street into your community. He's given you, or she, it's really a he, I'll go ahead and, and give that away now. He'll give you this, um, this brochure to get you ready. And so here's the inside spread. And I wanna bring you in to the first part of it where he starts out by telling you what photography is all about and how important it is. Uh, he tells you that this is not just a mechanical process. This is an art form and it's an interesting intersection that you are a participant in. And um, he explains the chemicals, he explains the posing. He basically sets the stage for you to have your photograph taken. There's a couple parts of this opening graph, this paragraph that I wanna share with you. One of them, and he's talking about himself, he says he is entitled to the same respect and consideration from you as your minister, your physician, or your lawyer. He's not fooling around. Your photographer, according to Bradley, is on the same plane as some of the most important people that you would visit in your town. Moreover, he says, he should have rules for the best government of his establishments, as it is for anyone else who you patronize. Consequently, you should be quite as unwilling to trespass upon such reasonable regulations as he may make. Now, that's a mouthful for modern ears to hear. In fact, it almost fills the entire screen here. But what he's really saying, if you want to boil it down, listen to your photographer. He knows best. Now, he gives us a nice little piece of advice here. When to come. He says a bright day isn't exactly necessary. He describes the optimum weather conditions. And it summarizes like this. Slightly cloudy, but not too bright. And he gives a warning, if you're light-haired and light-eyed, beware of the bright days. Now, what he's talking about here is how the, uh, the super bright lights are going to reflect, and that reflection is going to make it harder for him to capture the details on his negative. So he goes on to tell, if you're going to come, and we want you to come, Never hurry in. Don't rush yourself. That's not, uh, that's not going to make for the best picture. It is not going to help you to come in if you're all in a flurry. And then he says, he talks a little bit about how to dress. And to summarize what he's saying here, he says, dress naturally. Select the best color and the material for the camera. And what I find fascinating, if you go into the details and read what he wrote, he's offering a combination of the right colors to wear, and he's offering the combination of the right materials to wear. And this is because the wet plate photograph process is really only able to see a certain rather small spectrum of light. So 
the light becomes really important as it reflects off of your skin, your clothing, and you want to have the right clothing. There's optimal types of clothing and optimal types of material that you can wear that will play better to the lens and to the plate. Now, I'm paraphrasing a bunch of content here. I could do several programs just talking about the light and the color. In fact, we did a wonderful story a couple of issues ago in the magazine by Liz Topping that talks about this very subject. So if you wanna get more, go check out Liz's uh, article. Now, he, uh, uh, he goes on to talk more about um, hair color uh, being important and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the complexion of your skin. And what he's ultimately saying here, if you have a fair complexion, wear light clothes. If you have a dark complexion, wear dark clothes. And why is that? Well, because when the lens is open and the development process begins, if you have a very light complexion and you wear very dark clothes, the exposure time is going to be too short or too long. It's not gonna be able to capture both of them. So something isn't going to be quite right. It's either gonna be an overexposed face and underexposed clothes or an overexposed face and underexposed, vice versa. Same thing with a dark complexion. If you've got a dark complexion, wear darker clothes. So as you're looking at photographs, keep uh, keep that dynamic in mind and see if it holds true. Now, there's one caveat here. If you are a soldier, a sailor, a member of any organization that has a uniform, well, the rules don't really follow here because if you're a dark complected person and your profession forces you or causes you to wear an apron, or let's say, for example, you're a Confederate soldier and you have a a tan from being out in the sun. Well, you're gonna have a darker face and a lighter uniform. That's gonna cause problems for the photographer. Consequently, if you're very light skinned and you have a dark blue union uniform on, you're gonna have some problems. So my favorite part of this whole brochure is right here, how to behave. It's a wonderful little bit of information and uh, I'm not going to, uh, I'm gonna just sort of give you a couple excerpts from this. And this part, as you're looking at photographs and you wonder what were they thinking about, what was in their mind, you can sometimes see the underlying personality coming out of that person. I like to think that this paragraph here might give you some insight as to what you might be seeing. It says, while sitting for your picture, forget all dolefulness, and also forget where you are. Merely think enough of what you are really about to keep still and not a whit more. So it's almost, uh, the way that I translate that is he's almost talking about a meditative state. Maybe like get yourself into the zone, don't become too absorbed with the camera uh, sitting in front of you or the photographer behind the camera. Forget about the background that's behind you, the backdrop. Forget about what you see in front of you. Just sort of get into yourself. Just sit there, concentrate, but don't overdo it. So that resonates with me. I think, I feel like I've seen this in period photographs. Now, here's another uh, little tidbit about that I love. Uh, and this gets back to uh, uh, the earlier part when the photographer is talking about who he is and establishing himself and his authority. Uh, when he says, let your photographer pose and arrange you, he is responsible and will do his best. Gets right back to trust, right? And then he goes on to say, sitting pictures are preferably to standing ones generally, for the most graceful attitudes can be secured on them. At this point, the photographer can best decide for you. Trust him. In groups, also submit to his tastes. So, no mistake in here, listen to your photographer. He knows best. Now, that is the end of this brochure. So, imagine yourself you're in your town, 
he comes to town, the photographer comes to town in his wagon and gives you this brochure. You're going to follow everything he says. And if everything turns out right, a couple of things are going to happen. You're going to be able to have a portrait of you that you feel good about and you think represents your likeness. You're also going to have a satisfactory experience with Bradley, the photographer. And as Bradley moves to the next town, the word is going to spread that, wow, the photographer Bradley is amazing. And you've got to have your picture taken by Bradley. So it's going to be money in his pocket and a wonderful memory in your pocket. So now I want to take you to uh, look at some instructions from a master photographer and how that photographer shared best practices and a few tips with his peers. This is probably a name you know, uh, Marcus Aurelius Root. What a wonderful warrior, uh, what a wonderful name uh, out, of, uh, out of history. Marcus Aurelius Root, uh, life dates, 1808, 1888, a well-known Daguerrean, uh, a pioneer, worked in several cities, uh, notable for his gallery on Chestnut Street in Philadelphia, as you can see by the embossing on this velvet case. Now, photographer Root wrote a wonderful handbook. It's a classic. It's a Victorian classic. If you get a chance to search this book out. Um, it's, it's really, it's technically, it's a handbook. And you've got to read, if you read down on this title page of the book about midway, you'll get down to where he says, it's designed to be a textbook and a handbook. Now, this particular copy, this image comes from Cowan's Auctions. And um, I noticed the winning bid was in the neighborhood of $650. So congratulations to the owner of this rare book. You can also find it if you're not a book collector, um, but want to get the contents of it, you can do a search on archive.org. I believe it's also available on Google Books and you can get uh, a digitized copy of it. So uh, Root's book, Camera, and the camera and the pencil was written in 18, or I should say published in 1864, the camera and the pencil. If you go through this book and you hit uh, um, some of the information he begin to talk about around portrait photography and how important that is to, the, to understanding what photography and art is all about, this famous photographer makes the same point as Bradley, the traveling photographer, when he says the mere delineation of an object or the mere production of a likeness does not constitute a picture. So what is he saying? He's saying a couple things here. The first part of this sentence, the delineation of an object, he's talking about the technical production values. So the idea of you knowing how to use your camera and how to operate it and how to develop a photograph, yeah, those are important. In fact, they're essential, but it's not everything. The second part of it, the mere production of a likeness, there he is talking about the, um, he's talking about the actual development part of the process and all that. And he says, does not constitute a picture. He's using the term picture purposefully. Uh, a picture versus a photograph. A picture in this case is the artful photograph. That's what Root is talking about. Now, it boils down to a formula. If you continue reading, you're going to get this formula. Uh, he says position and arrangement, that is of the subject, plus light, right? You got to have lighting, plus shade, that's the way the light is artfully arranged to produce shadows, plus accessories. That's your backdrop, it's your chair, it's other props, if you will, that are in the gallery. Uh, it might be objects that the subject brings with them. All of those equal the successful portraits, the picture. So keep those in mind as you're looking at photographs in your collection 
or if you're not a collector and have a general interest in Civil War photography, or in fact, any photography from the 19th century, or in fact, any photographs today, all of this still applies. The way you sit, the way you stand, the way you're arranged, the lighting of the photograph, what's around you, all of those contribute to telling the story of who you are or who the person is in the photograph that you see. Now, Mr. Root, Marcus Aurelius, goes on to talk about characteristics in photographs. And this I found particularly fascinating as I was way down the research hole. I believe I was on page 300 at this point. I uh, go way, way down the research rabbit hole and you're gonna find the characteristics that he's looking for. So it's amazing to me how the characteristics that Root describes, how these six tips line up. You can apply them, you can look at a Civil War photograph um, right now and see these in action. In fact, you don't even have to leave this screen because I'm gonna share some with you. So here's Root's tip number one. Don't place the figure in the middle of the picture. I'm gonna show you some examples here. The big red line going down the center shows you where the middle is. And you're going to see, in fact, that most photographers abide by that rule. Not everyone, but most of them do. And you'll see as you follow this red line that it's not precisely in the center. The subject might be a little bit over to the left, might be a little over to the right. Um, as we have right here, this um, uh, continental, his sword is almost dead in the center, but he's just a little, little off kilter. This gentleman, look what's going on here with the musket moving diagonally in one direction and his body moving at a slight diagonal in the other direction. There's artfulness, there's balance, and there's that red line right in the middle that is not being uh, violated. Here's the image I showed up front, and you can see that line going right down the middle, but the angle of his extended leg, the angle of his bended leg, the angle of his back, they're all forming um, a certain balance in the portrait that is quite pleasing, it's quite interesting, and it's personal to this individual. Now, roots tip number two, leave more space in front than behind. I had to think about this one a little bit, leave more space in front than behind. Well, in a way, uh, it makes sense if you start looking at examples, and I'm just gonna show you this one here, which I think will give you a pretty good idea of what we're talking about. Um, look at the, notice the canvas backdrop, the white canvas backdrop behind this officer. Notice the Star Spangled Banner and notice the wood um, uh, column pedestal, I guess is more appropriate. I believe there's, yeah, there is a column uh, back there. So, but notice those objects and then notice how close they are. It appears to me that the officer's arm, he's actually standing behind the pedestal. It looks like the one part of the pedestal is actually in front of him. Um, the drapes of the flag, the way the flag is folded, I believe that's actually in front of him. And he may be no more than inches away from that canvas backdrop. So he's really close to that backdrop and there's much more distance between the officer and the operator of the camera. So notice the distance between that backdrop uh, and the props that the studio props that are surrounding your soldier when you look at the image. Tip number three. I guess there's a fascination as uh, with, with tallness. I, it may be a human condition. Um, I'm not one of the tall, so it's hard for me to speak to it, but I love this little tidbit. Uh, the higher the head, towards the top of the picture, the taller they appear. Okay, that makes sense. And here's an example that I think plays to that. Uh, if you look at this gentleman, 
I don't exactly know quite how tall he was, but notice how he's posed. Uh, you see a lot more of the frock coat below his waist belt. And look at the distance between the top of his hair and the brass mat. There really isn't a lot of distance there. In fact, uh, the way that the uh, tintype is placed in this mat, the top of his bayonet is actually cut off. It's cropped out of the picture. So he's really, really tall. And you have to ask yourself, did this photographer know of Root's tips? Did, did he think about that as he was taking this photograph? I want to I want to believe that it's very possible that he did. Of course, we may never know the answer to that. But this idea of focusing your lens and having the subject uh, a little closer to the top of the frame is a good thing, according to Root. Tip number four, make sure the subject is engaged in some occupation. What does he mean by that? Well, here's an example uh, of a soldier holding up his fists. He clearly is not standing in the center of the frame. And this is more of a literal translation of Root's idea of occupation. But what Root is really saying is, don't just have the person staring straight forward uh, with their hands at their sides. Um, have them engaged in doing something. If they're a soldier, have them cradling a sword, holding their musket, uh, folding their arms, holding their cap, draping an arm over a chair or a balustrade, have them doing something, put them in an environment that makes them look interesting. So although Root used the term uh, occupation, what he really means is have them look occupied, have them look like they are engaged because if they're engaged in the photograph, they will communicate some subtle human emotion. Now, I like to think that your better photographers had a sense of what that person was all about, or maybe they had an idea of how they wanted to be posed. And in that pre-game discussion with the photographer, the photographer got a sense of what the sitter was all about and then made some uh, arrangements to put that individual in an environment that made them look occupied in a way that was true to who they were. Tip number five, harmonious contrast. I just like saying that. We all want harmonious contrast in our lives. And here Root wants to have it in the photographs. And so he's basically saying, get that light coming in at a 45 degree angle. And why is that? Well, because you want to be able to get the nuances of the face. You want to get the lightness of their face you want to get the darkness of their face. So the light source in this case, if you notice uh, the one side of his face opposite the direction of the arrows here um, is in, in the shadows where his forehead and the other side of his cheek are lit. And you'll also notice if you look down a little bit, head down to where his hands are, you'll see that the top part uh, of, his, of his hand um, is hitting the light. And on the other side, his fingers, where he's holding the fife, that's also hitting the light. Now, I tried to put my light in a 45 degree angle to be able to give you some sense of what that's all about. So you can see on this side of my face, I'm a little darker. This side of my face, I'm a little bit lighter, all the way up into the scalp. So um, think about that that 45 degree angle, if you look at your photographs and or other photographs and other collections, you'll notice that by and large, most photographers are pretty darn good about following that tip. Now, the last tip is a classic one. Keep it simple. Do not overcomplicate your pose. And I like to think that this is probably an example of that. Um, this soldier, if I put the red line down the middle, 
he'd be slightly, ever so slightly off kilter. It's, it's somewhere around, it, the, 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 the center line is somewhere just a little bit to the left of his fife. Uh, but talk about simple. He's standing up straight. He's holding that fife. He's holding that buoy knife. He's forming some really strong verticals. Look how close he is to the top of the frame. You can also see the lighting coming in from right to left in this case. Look at the lower side of his face in shadows. The upper side has the highlights. Uh, and talk about keeping it interesting as well. Um, have him look occupied. The fact that he's holding this object, these objects tells us who he is. He's a warrior, he's a soldier, he's a musician, and he's also young. And he, apparently he's looking for a fight because he's got that revolver sitting in his pocket. So that, my friends, is Root's six tips. And that also is the end of this presentation. So I hope you found this interesting. And I hope the next time that you look at photographs in your collection, or if you look at photographs in a friend's collection, uh, or looking at them in Military Images Magazine, or on Facebook, YouTube, wherever you consume Civil War photography, keep Roots uh, uh, six tips in mind as you're going through them. And also think about the itinerant photographer Bradley uh, and the directions that he was giving to the subjects. Because if you put them together, you're going to see that they really do explain a lot about why these individuals pose the way they do. Now, one more bit of information. As I mentioned up front, this uh, program is sponsored by Military Images Magazine. If you're a subscriber, I give you great thanks. I appreciate your support. What you do by subscribing helps keep us able to do what we do. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, we showcase, we interpret, and we preserve these amazing images, and we help keep them alive for future gen generations. So if you support us by subscribing, again, thank you so much. If you're not a subscriber and you'd like to be, if you're intrigued by this program, or the other episodes, which you can find on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, um, go over to shopmilitaryimages.com. It's very reasonable. A subscription is $24.95 for one year. And if you add up the pages, that's 320 pages, four quarterly issues, 80 pages each. That's bigger than a bunch of books, uh, at least a bunch of books that I know that are about yay big. Um, this is this is a this is a good size a good size chunky book. So twenty four ninety five is a pretty darn good bargain. So help us by supporting us through your subscription. And if you don't want the print edition, you can always go with the digital edition. Digital edition is nineteen ninety five. So go check us out at shopmilitaryimages.com. And uh, I thank you in advance. I also thank you for watching this program and we will see you on a future episode. So take care, have a great night.